This is a practicum, so it's supposed to be practical. And uh, for the most part, I've tried to uh, always aim toward the um, very practical. Sometimes, though, you have to get theoretical before you can get practical. And so uh, the beginning of what I'm going to be talking about will probably strike you as the most theoretical of anything that I've gone through over the past number of sessions. And I hope you will bear with me and, uh, and not too, take too much of a, uh, an affront about that, because I think it's going to get us to a place that you'll find, hopefully, practical. Um, and I put that quote by Bob Dylan up there just to kind of keep us on an even keel. You know, we, this is a little bit on the theoretical side, but let's not get completely overboard here. So, you know, the uh, world of research has gone berserk too much paperwork. And I think that uh, oftentimes uh, it's funny. I think it's funny because sometimes it's true. And uh, so we're going to use that as our guide not to get uh, completely ahead of ourselves. Um, another quote that I love, because it's funny, but it's also true, is uh, uh, that works in practice, but does it work in theory? Um, which is, of course, the twist of usually the way people say that. And what that means to me is it's pretty easy to come up with conceptual uh, theories of the world. And they sometimes seem to work just great in a single case. And then you go to the next case, and it turns out it doesn't work. So. Uh, I say this as a caution about what I'm going to talk about um, and to uh, always keep at least one foot firmly grounded in the uh, practical world. I'm just going to close this door, cut the noise down. Um, I'm also calling this scorekeeping, which probably uh, strikes you as a uh, peculiar word to use in a business context because we think of sports. And I'm doing that to try to expand our framework of how we're going to be keeping track of things. Scorekeeping is beyond what you just would think of as accounting. So if I called this accounting, you say, OK, well now we're going to talk about debits and credits. But I really want to start off with a much broader view, and that's why I'm calling it scorekeeping. And specifically, I really do want to start with a sports analogy. Um, because, um, of course, that's what we do in sports, is we keep score. Um, and I want to use that as a way for us to think about how does this apply to the business world. Well, first of all, I, I, I hope there's at least one or two sports fans here. You don't have to be an avid sports fan. If you don't know anything about sports at all, just kind of bear with He's got a baseball cap. Um, the way you keep score depends on the type of sport. That's pretty obvious. Most sports, the higher the number wins. But there are some sports where that's not true, like the lower the number wins, such as golf. golf you know? um, and um, and there's, a, there's a couple of others. And sometimes it's a linear scale, one, two, three, four, five, you know, uh, as in table tennis. Uh, and sometimes it has this funny lumpiness. You, know, you get you know, seven point, six points for a touchdown and then an extra point. And, and you get a field goal for three, and they don't add up, and it's all kind of uh, different. Uh, sometimes you can only can score one time, like in hockey. Sometimes in baseball, you can get a grand slam. You score four times. Uh, so there's many different um, uh, aspects of that. And then that's just the score. So uh, uh, it depends on the type of, of sport. And then the metrics that we tend to apply obviously vary by sport. So in baseball, we've got the earned run average. Uh, but if you talked about an earned run average in football, it doesn't make any sense at all. It's, it's nonsensical, because in football, we have other kinds of metrics, so that every kind of sport has to have its own metric. Um, and there's been a dramatic proof that the better information you have gives you some differential success. Has anybody, have people heard about Moneyball? You know who this guy is, Bill James? Anybody? Uh, the baseball guys, yes. But, um, you know, Americans invented sports statistics. You know, the, uh, and we're kind of, uh, I think it may be part of our culture that we just like to measure stuff obsessively. Um, and for a long time in baseball, which has probably got the longest, richest tradition of being, you know, the quintessential American sport, 
there's been a lot of statistics going way, way back to the, to the early days. And the things that were measured <coughs> were the traditional things that uh, everybody thought about, like earn run average um, and, uh, and comparisons like that. And this was the, um, the parochial but the traditional uh, uh, view. And that's how baseball managers and club owners manage their teams. They would look at guys at the best earn run average, or for pitchers, it would be a different measure. And they would, they would look at these traditional measures and say, well, that's the guy we want to uh, uh, you know, uh, sign up in our next contract. So this obsessive guy named Bill James got involved. And he was looking at all kinds of statistics and measurements that nobody else was looking at. And he made some amazing discoveries that actually there was a, a whole set of performance that was not captured in the traditional way. Um, he became the Red Sox statistician. And I'm, I come from Boston, so you know, obviously you know what my favorite baseball team is. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with the um, previously depressing history of the Red Sox, where they uh, had Babe Ruth, uh, Babe Ruth as their star, and the owner of the Red Sox wanted to put on a Broadway play, so he um, essentially uh, dropped Babe Ruth. They were Babe Ruth was picked up by the hated New York Yankees, um, and uh, the Red Sox lost his, his uh, tremendous ability, and as a result, never won a World Series until very recently. And actually, the very recently, I think, is in large part because Bill James got involved with the Red Sox and started coaching them on which players they really wanted, how to organize the team, which batter should follow which batter, which pitcher should be in what rotation. Oh my God, it was a revolution. And the Red Sox became these, uh, uh, this phenomenal uh, success. So, all right, so that's, that's sports. So how do we turn this into business? What's, what is the analogy that I'm talking about? Well. The type of sport is really the type of business. Okay. The detailed metrics are obviously going to vary by industry. So in some industries you might have commissions, in other industries you don't have commissions, you might have sales. Sometimes you have a big uh, difference between discounts, that are a really big deal, uh, and in other industries there's hardly any discounts. Sometimes it has to do, you know, you come up with different terms of art. But basically, really, that's like the earned run average or, or uh, things like that. These are kind of overall measurements. What's really important, though, as you get into a business is to be able to figure out how to get that detailed kind of secret information that's buried in there. And I'm going to present the case to you that, that you don't do that through traditional accounting. Because traditional accounting is at the level of the earned run average. Okay, that's the kind of things that have been tried and true. We, we, this is the way we measure profit in the insurance industry. We all do that. Okay, but if everybody's looking at the same information, then nobody has a differential opportunity to do something different in the business and succeed in a new way. One of the things about entrepreneurship and small enterprises is you've got the flexibility to be smarter in doing this than big behemoth companies that are almost entirely reliant on their accounting systems. Okay? So that's what I want you to keep in mind. Oh, how do we advance this thing? We need technical assistance. Bear with me here as I attempt to figure out what to do. Whoop, that's not going to do it. There we go. Okay. I don't know why I didn't. Okay, the first law of, sc of scorekeeping. Uh, I would submit to you is m you manage what you measure, but measure what's important. Um, it, it probably is almost a, a, a tautology that is a self-evident truth that you 
really can't manage what you can't measure. I mean, how can you manage something if you don't measure it? Uh, I mean, how do you know what to do? So uh, if we wanted to manage the air quality in this room, and we had no idea and had no way to measure the air quality in this room, what, what are we supposed to do? Stop breathing? I mean, you, you have a very limited set of options. So you have to uh, measure something before you can manage it. And if you measure something that's uh, trivial, then you'll be managing the trivial. So you really need to measure what's really important because that's the only way you're going to manage something that's really important. Does that kind of sound, sound obvious when you state it? But uh, oftentimes people don't think of it that way. So okay, so then what the question is, what's important? Uh, if we all knew what was important, I guess we wouldn't need to uh, spend a lot of time thinking about it. It depends on what the company does. Yeah, that obviously makes sense. Depends on what kind of skill set we're talking about. It depends on th these terms that you've heard a lot. Business model, business definition. I have a cute little cartoon down here showing that, uh, you know, what the hell is a business model, frankly. It's, it's a, it's everybody has heard, everybody's heard this term, right? Is everybody unfamiliar with the term business model? Never heard that before? Does anybody, you know, what is a business model? If it, got a, anybody want to tell me what a business model is? Uh, on a simple level, it's the concept of the, how you go about making money in your business. Yeah, right, I guess. And then can you give me one more s sentence of articulation? I mean, it's kind of hard, right? I mean, I, I mean, uh, I've I've had a number of students come up to me and says, "I don't, uh, I, I want a good business model, but what is it? You know, how do I know I have one?" Um, some people think a business model is who's buying, you know, which is your customer and how they're related to you and the flow of funds or something. It could be that. It's a number of things. We're going to delve into this, and that's why I'm saying this is a theoretical conversation. Hopefully, it'll get us back to a, a, a practical side. But I th I think generally. Uh, it's frequently misunderstood. You know, a lot of people, it's, it's almost like saying democracy. What does that mean? And people give you different kinds of definitions. It's not like they're inconsistent. They're just kind of fuzzy and all over the map, and different people will focus on different things. There's no right definition, I don't believe, of a, of a business model or a business definition itself. But because it's so fuzzy and floating around there, it's not terribly useful. So I'm going to try to bring this down uh, to a level where it becomes more useful. And to do that, bear with me, I need a conceptual framework. So now we're going into high energy physics, okay? So we'll, we'll hopefully be able to cycle back. There's many frameworks. There's probably an infinite n number of frameworks. And I've put up here one framework that I find helpful, and I'm gonna take you through a conceptual exercise with it to show you how it's helpful to me and perhaps it will be helpful to you, and I'm not suggesting that you adopt this framework and run with it and for the rest of your life. You may be able to come up with a much better one in six weeks or maybe in three hours. Uh, that's great. Uh, but what's helpful about a framework, it's a way of looking at the world and being able to organize thinking about the world without just kind of floating out there uh, without any grounding. Okay, so what is this framework? Framework is nothing more than a conceptual, idea uh, that helps you understand the environment. This framework, uh, and you know from my consulting background, I love matrices, you know, two by two or three by three, so okay, you got one. And um, this is looking at two dimensions. The kind of asset that we're talking about, going down the left-hand side, the kind of asset, and going across the top is what, what you're doing with that asset. Um, I'm going to suggest to you that human beings do four basic things. You either create and or distribute and or rent and or broker the assets. And I'm going to delve into what I mean by those words. And the type of asset that's out there are physical assets. We intuitively know what that means. You know, things made of atoms that we can, you know, manipulate. Financial assets, here we're talking about money and money-like type instruments. And intangible assets uh, that are, tend to be ideas, patents, things that are not necessarily in a physical embodiment to be an asset. 
And I have a list here of the many types of examples. I've interspersed real companies with industries to try to give you a flavor for what I'm really talking about to help you just understand this framework. Obviously, you can come up with a different framework and have different lists and things up here, so bear with me as I go through this one. So if we start in the upper left, we're talking about the creation of assets that are physical. Obviously, we have things like manufacturers. Intuitively, no, that's what they do. They have plants, and they use metal or plastic or whatever, and they make stuff. Home builders would be another. You're, you're uh, you know, taking raw materials, lumber, tiles, concrete, and you're making something. Uh, General Electric would be an example of a company that is largely, uh, has been historically a manufacturer. And that's because you see their brand names on stuff, some of which you have in your home. Um, if we move to the distribution of physical assets, uh, FedEx is an example. Uh, why FedEx? What are they distributing? Packages. And you might say, wait, wait a minute, I thought a distributor, you know, bought from a wholesaler and sold to a retailer. Okay, well, I'm going to broaden the definition of distribution here a little bit. So I'm going to call FedEx a distributor. And in a minute, you'll see why I'm doing this. Walmart. Well, you thought, you know, you'd say, wait a minute, they're, they're a retailer. Uh, how can they be a distributor? Well, Walmart has managed to integrate itself all along the food chain, so to speak, so that they, in fact, have no wholesaler. And they really are in the business of distributing in a minute. Hopefully, this will become a little more clear. Car dealerships. We would think, yeah, they're distributors. They get cars from manufacturers, and they sell it to the public. OK, that's a pretty straightforward, yeah. But everybody says that those are definitely uh, dealerships. And wholesalers, we would say, absolutely. That's what we mean by distributing, isn't it? Wholesalers. OK, so I put in non-obvious and obvious examples to try to get you to understand the concept I'm building. If we go to rent, I could have used the word landlord. I did, actually, in my previous slide. And I thought the word was so pejorative um, that I would spend five minutes explaining away the term. So I'm just going to say rent. You, you rent assets. Of course, if you have land, or apartment buildings, and you rent, you are a landlord. So, you know, this is kind of like that. I have some examples. Hotels. What, would you think of that as the landlord business? Not strictly. It's a very short-term rental, I suppose you could say. But actually, you have a physical asset that you hold. Uh, you may, in fact, be renting it from someone else. You could be a hotel manager, but that would be a slightly different business. Let's say you own a hotel, and you rent it out, uh, or you, you know, uh, on, a, on a daily or weekly basis, you're, you're a landlord, essentially. You're renting it. Airlines, what are they renting? Seats, right? Okay, they own the plane, and you rent the seat. Uh, and you might say, you're not renting a seat. You're traveling from San Francisco to Boston. Well, yeah, you are, but um, actually they're renting the capability to get there, uh, and in, including the physical seat that goes along with it. Hertz, clearly, they're renting cars. That one's an obvious example. You wouldn't argue with that one. Uh, landlords, I put up there, hospitals. Probably don't think of hospitals as renters, you know, being landlords. But they have a physical facility and a lot of expensive equipment. And, uh, and they rent it to you for an exorbitant fee sometimes, you know. Um, and then arenas. I put another example, big, you know, down in Miami, the big arena. Uh, which uh, it gets confusing if it's associated with a sports team, but that's another example. Brokers, physical assets, brokers, real estate agents, eBay. Anybody not understand why eBay is a broker? They're essentially getting a fee for matching a buyer and a seller. Uh, manufacturer reps, auctions, you know, there's tons of other examples of people that are brokering physical assets. By the way, does everybody know what an asset is? Can you give me a, a five-word or something definition of an asset? Or a two-word definition? Asset, asset, asset. Some of you are business students. What's an asset? What's an asset? Quick. Well, assets equals liability. No, oh, no, no, that's what it's equal to. What is an asset? A position of value. Uh, some, some value as a Some value, yeah. How about a hamburger? That has a value. I'm going to eat it in 20 minutes. Is that an asset? 
No, it's not. Not an asset. No. No, this, this, this bottle of water. Is it an asset? I'm going to drink it entirely in a few seconds. An asset. How about a possession that has exchangeable value? Exchangeable value. To other parties. Well, okay. I've got the Brooklyn Bridge. What am I going to exchange it for? I got a. May, okay, but so it's, it's not it's really exchangeable. I, 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 I would, let me submit to you that an asset is a future benefit. That's it, a future benefit. Now, what do we mean by future? Well, according to FASB, it means it lasts a year or more. Okay, so we have an accounting definition uh, that's, in, you know, that's been generally accepted that says an asset is a future benefit that lasts at least a year. I would leave it a little looser and say it's a future benefit. What about cash? What about cash? Is cash an asset? But it doesn't last for a year if you're constantly spending it. Yeah. Uh, cash is really interesting. Cash is debt. Yes. Hmm? It's debt. But we'll get into that. That's, a, that's, a, that's kind of, of course, cash in your bank is an asset. And, and um, if you spend it tomorrow, it turned out not to be an asset. But it could be an asset because uh, you, know, you ch could choose not to spend it. Just like you could have a car and keep it for a year. That's a, that's a, it's a long-term benefit. The question is, who owns it? The car stays there as, a, as an asset, even if you don't own it. The cash stays there as somebody's asset, even if you spend it. It becomes the asset of the person that you give it to. So asset, long-term benefit. So all the things I'm talking about here, physical, financial, or intangible, are long-term benefits. That's what I mean by this. And that's what everybody means by, by an asset. Let's talk quickly about financial. Creating, financial, creating money, essentially. Uh, you'll see it's colored slightly. It says Federal Reserve. And that's a government monopoly on money creation. Has America always been this way? When was the Federal Reserve created? Anybody know? 1913. Pretty recently. Not even 100 years old. We're about to come up on the 100th anniversary in three years of the Federal Reserve System. Before the Federal Reserve System, we had some other stuff. Anybody remember a guy named Alexander Hamilton? Did you remember anything from early American history? All those guys, the greenback people? Ever hear, remember the greenbackers? What the hell were they talking about? The gold standard, the greenbacks. Well, it turns out that when the country was formed, how many different currencies do we have? Do you know what the first currency was in the United States? You'll be surprised. It was the Spanish gold piece. It was gold, because everybody said, OK, gold's gold. But the point is, in the early days of the Republic, and for a very long time, and during the, the uh, 1700s and 1800s, there was a tremendous fight about whether the federal government should have a monopoly on the ability to create money. And in 1913, we resolved that, at least for the current period. An interesting question for you is if the United States government continues to run up unbelievable deficits what are we going to be like 50 years from now? Will the government still have a monopoly on the creation of money? It's a deep question, but not for this class. OK. Distributing financial stuff. Mutual funds. Venture, uh, venture capitalists, banks, private equity. Fidelity is a company. Anybody have a conceptual problem with how could that be true? They're taking various kinds of things and bundling them up. That's what a mutual fund is. Uh, you know, uh, a bank is, is in a similar kind of role. This will become clear in a moment, a little bit better. Renting financial instruments. This is pretty conceptual here. It's getting a little tough. Insurance companies, Aetna, banks, Fannie Mae. What, what is a bank renting? Money. Somebody say money? Money. That's what a loan is, really. I mean, if, it was a, if, if you were a, a physical building, like an apartment building, you don't call it a loan. 
but you could say someone's loaning you their apartment in return for something. So you're actually renting the money in return for interest and a promise to pay it back. So that's the rental business. And banks is very interesting are in the distribution and the rental business. And there's been a tremendous amount of law about how we handle this financial area because much mischief can be done here. So we try to segregate banks and insurance companies and we say we'll put them together, then we'll pull them apart, and we have a financial crisis and we'll do something else. And uh, so it's kind of a complex, messy area. But it has to do with who's renting, who's distributing, who's creating, and why is this an issue? Think back to the feudal society in mostly Europe. What was the condition of feudal society? Just from, of course, they didn't have many financial assets. People only really used gold, jewelry. They had no intangible assets anybody thought had any value. It was only physical, uh, physical uh, uh, assets. And going back to a feudal society pre-Adam Smith, so pre, let's say, 1750, so think of Europe generally, 1500 to 17 something. What was the condition of the economy? Who, who held what? Land. Yeah, they tend to be called royalty in those days. What, did they, what business were they in? They were in everything. They controlled everything. That's why we had an American Revolution in part, because people said, wait a minute, if they're the renters and the distributors and the creators, I mean, I mean what, what are we doing here? We're serfs. So the, the development of capitalism in many respects was the breaking apart of renting and creating and distributing uh, for physical assets. I'm getting a little beyond things here, but there's one more point I'd like to make, which is Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, a great book, still worth reading. has to do, and he had this whole theory of the invisible hand, which you've all, I'm sure, uh, can't possibly have missed. But one of the things that is implied there and not often fully stated is that the wealth of nations comes from the creation of assets. In fact, if you can't create assets, you can't distribute rent and broker them. So the future of a country that do, no longer creates assets is not that bright. Well, you tell me. I mean, I've got some other things there. Where is the service economy? Is, do you see a lot of service things on the creation side? I mean, we've got um, actors, athletes, software developers. They're creating intangible assets. We don't think of those as really service ass things. Some of the service things are uh, we've got lawyers, doctors, publishers, theaters. That's kind of their renters. Uh, got Comcast, Amazon, their distributors. Got talent scouts, literary scouts. You know, got some, so, I mean, it, it's more kind of on this side, the, the, the service side. So when people say the America has lost their manufacturing base, who cares, you know, the Industrial Revolution is over, so what if China is making everything for the rest of the world? There's no reason to worry about that, is, is what the, the comment is. So you, you might think about that a little bit. Okay, that's the general framework. Let me help you kind of crystallize this. I think this will um, make it uh, much more accessible. I've got the same thing across the top, the creation, distribution, rent, and broker activities. And down the left-hand side, I've added some attributes. So this is a way for you to kind of equilibrate this with your own thinking. The first is the activity. What, does, what's real, what, are, what are these people doing who are doing these various things? For the creation of assets, whether they're physical or financial or, or intangible, it doesn't matter. You're essentially designing, assembling components, transforming raw materials, inventing, those kind of words. That's what we mean by creation. And uh, so if you're inventing, it could be you're inventing a physical product or it could be an intangible, et cetera. Um, if you're distributing, you're doing one of two things or perhaps both. You're aggregating small units or you're breaking bulk, and the reasons you're doing this is for the economy of scale. Let's go back to Federal Express. What are they doing? Distributing. They're distributing, and what are they, what are they doing? What, what, what is the, f f you know, when you send them a package, what happens to it? Did you know that every single package goes to Memphis? Yeah. I mean, not actually, they've changed their model a little bit. 
if you, now they figured out if you mail a FedEx package on Park Avenue in New York and it's going to 130th Street, it doesn't go to M Memphis first. But actually, <laughs> that was used to. And it, they would send everything to Memphis. They were basically aggregating small units, packages from America, packages, you know, all over, and sending them to Memphis. Are these people crazy? Are, are, are they nuts? What kind of crazy distribution system is that? We'll send everything to Memphis? Well, it turns out that the economy of scale of taking disparate packages, sending them to one place to sort out, and redistributing them works. It makes a lot of money. So that's an example of an aggregator of small units. And, a, and another way of distributing is you do the opposite, essentially. You break bulk. You get a container of stuff, and you sell it to people who don't want a container. So when you go to a grocery store and you buy two apples, you're essentially the end result of somebody who had like 10,000 apples. Why? Because you don't want 10,000 apples. In fact, you couldn't uh, eat them all. And remember, that's not, apples are not really assets. You know, they're not exactly future benefits, although so I'm, but uh, the nature is a breaking bulk, that's what you're doing, or you're aggregating. Uh, if you're renting, you have a different kind of activity. You're collecting, preparing, organizing, and scheduling assets for limited use. So think of Avis uh, or Enterprise Car or somebody like that. What do, what, do they, what do they spend their time doing? You know, where are our cars? Who's going to use them? Do they have gas in them? Do they need an oil change? You know, how are they going to ship one car to some other place because somebody dropped it off? I mean, it's all this scheduling. Hotels, they're figuring out what rooms are going to be available and cleaning them up and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So you're constantly figuring out how to prepare your assets for this limited use and then re-prepare them and so forth. So you're constantly doing that kind of activity. That's what renters do. Um, brokers match buyers to sellers. It's pretty obvious. They identify prospects sometimes, not necessarily... Uh, actively involved in that matching, and they get involved with information services because they're, they're the watchers of the marketplace. They're seeing what's going on, and they're able to make some money by doing that. Sometimes they use the information themselves, and sometimes they sell that information. Do you know the most profitable group of people on Wall Street? Who are the most profitable people on Wall Street by, by a fantastic margin? No? You know what a market maker is? Anybody know about stock exchanges? I mean, think about now they're getting virtual, so it's a little more complicated. But if you go to the New York Stock Exchange, anybody seen a picture of the New York Stock Exchange? You're on the floor, and they have these little kind of funny little stations. And there's guys going like this. If you go to the Commodities Exchange, the guys are going like, going like this. They have like little, little runners. And there's, right? I mean, you've seen some pictures like that. You're probably wondering what the hell are these people doing. Um, but at the center, uh, if you watch carefully, there's a little guy not a little, some, somebody standing there. He's not making any signaling. He's just going like this. You know. There's a market maker. The market maker is basically the, the, the master broker who is matching buyers and sellers. And how does he make money? He knows how many buyers and sellers there are for anything. So how much money could you make, for example, if there was a stock, let's say um, General Electric, and you know, knew at this instant, there were 10,000 buyers and 3 million sellers. What would you do with that stock? You would sell the stock. If you owned it, you would sell it. If there's a whole lot of people who want to sell it, did I say that wrong? If there's 10,000 buyers and 3 million people who want to sell, these are people in line, and you have some stock, what are you going to do? You're going to sell it. Because there's so many sell for whatever reason, you don't care what the reason is, you just know there's a whole lot of sellers. People who want to sell. Very few people who want to buy, which means the stock the price is gonna what? Go down. Everybody wants to sell. No one wants to let's say make it simple. No one wants to buy. Everybody wants to sell. What do you want to do? You wanna you wanna sell first, right? You want to be the first person to sell, not the three millionth person to sell. That's what specialists do. That's what these market makers do. And so they're basically the master brokers. You make a lot of money doing that. Okay. 
On the revenue side, how they, when you see the accounting type statements or the verbiage of the industry, if you're creating, um, you're, you have things like there's an outright sell, you're, you're, you have basic sales, you're, you're selling the product, you've got royalties, rights, licenses, that's the kind of language that we use. If you're distributing, there's a cost markup, a service fee, a management fee. If you're renting, it's you know, rent, premiums, uh, admission, interest, service fees, billing. We use different terms. And if you're brokering, it's a transaction fee, appraisal fee, and so forth. Okay, let's talk about the food industry quickly. Um, and I want to bring this now down to a reality. It was very, very conceptual. I hope you're still with me. I know this seems a little painful. But now I'm going to go to the, an example of the food industry. And on physical creation of assets, ranchers, growers, restaurants, if they're like high-end restaurants where the menu is really important, you've got a chef that's specially preparing things from raw ingredients, food manufacturers, Campbell's Soup, people like that. If you're distributing, you're uh, fishermen. Why are fishermen distributors? What are the two things distributors do? Break bulk and aggregate small units. What is a fisherman out there doing? He's fishing. He's trying to find a, a bunch of fish out there. You know? and, uh, and, and why is that a lucrative thing for him to do? Because it's too expensive for you to go out there and get one fish. Okay? So he's a distributor. He's kind of a reverse distribu distributor. Probably don't think of fishermen that way, but that's what he's up to. Fast food is essentially distributing sugar and fat, okay? And I say they're distributors as opposed to restaurants that I put in the other side is because they don't, they're not, they're, they're, they're basically have manufactured products that other people give them, like buns and stuff like that, and they're figuring out a way to, to, to uh, give it to you, all right? Um, Co-ops, wholesalers, uh, uh, retailers in the food industry. On the renting side, um, we've got um, venues, you know, you want to have a party, so you rent a place to have the food, you know, like a uh, uh, ballroom or something like that. Feedlots, anybody coming from an agricultural state, you know what feedlots are. Uh, you're renting space to actually plump up animals, essentially. Vending machines, that's pretty obvious. You're renting uh, a physical location and a, and a, a set of me mechanical machinery to dispense food. Farms, why are farms... Uh, in the rental business as opposed to, I had growers over there, because many farms, the people who are the farmers, are not the owners of the actual land. And actually that's the way it was during the Middle Ages. The, you know, we had a difference between the peasants, they're, they're you know, over here and the, and the landowners over here, equipment, so forth. On the broker side, we've got food uh, brokers, Cargill, anybody heard of Cargill? Cargill, Carg, I don't even know how you pronounce it, Cargill, Carg, it's, a, it's, a, it's a privately owned company. It's one of the largest corporations in the entire world. Most of you have never heard of it. It's a pretty good business being a broker. They've gone into other things since. If you create, um, on, on the food part, if you're in the creation but on the financial side, remember it's kind of a government monopoly on that creation of money. So we've got government food stamps and farm subsidies and stuff like that. This is basically the government, instead of actually creating dollars, literally are creating uh, some kind of another piece of paper that's like a dollar. So they're creating money over there. Distributing are the commodity futures, exchanges, freight forwarders, a lot of stuff like that. This is all the financial part of food. Um, on renting, agri agricultural land, mortgages, crop credits, equipment loans. This is the banking industry getting involved with the food side of, of agriculture industry, commodity brokers on the brokerage, on the intangibles, we've got things like celebrity chefs, brands, cookbooks, formulas, processes. Uh, in a minute we'll talk about Coca-Cola, which has got a, uh, a formula. The distribution of intangibles, food channels, restaurant guides, open table, which is a company where you can get a reservation to sit down and have a, have a meal. Renting, you've got diet spas, fast food franchises, beverage brands. They're actually renting the use of some other intangible asset. And then, of course, the brokers, literary agents, executive search, all that kind of stuff. Okay, brings it down a little bit. Let's go one more level, talk about Coca-Cola. So we're just drilling down here. What does Coca-Cola do? Well, back uh, 100 years ago or so, they, they, it was a patent medicine. 
um, as a secret formula. So you'd say they, they created an intangible asset that then they turned into a concentrate, literally a kind of a syrup, uh, or, or I'm not frank, I don't know what it is, it's secret, you know, something, some liquid. And they um, then the, have an arrangement with bottlers that they don't own. Sometimes they have minority ownerships and bottlers, and they have relationships with restaurants and other kinds of distributors, and they distribute the concentrate you would probably die if you drank it. So they're not distributing a food item per se. And then the other thing they do is uh, they rent their Coca-Cola intangible uh, brand, which comes out of the secret formula. They rent that to the bottlers and they allow the restaurants to use it and signage and stuff like that. And they do one other thing, which is because the end product made by essentially the bottlers is essentially sugar, Coca-Cola has nothing to do with sugar in their own product. They go into the futures market because they want to be able to manipulate the price of their product and not have it become too expensive. And they know a hell of a lot about sugar because of that worldwide. And they're basically in the hedge fund business for sugar. That's what Coca-Cola does. The black lines indicate activities they're actually in. And the green line is where they have important relationships. Now, is this the way most of you thought about Coca-Cola before 10 minutes ago? All right, so now I'm going to ask you, or think about, and let's go back to the way normally you would talk about this. What is Coca-Cola's business model? Before this, you might have said selling soft drinks. I don't know what you would have said. Let me ask you. What, so what do you think it is now? What's Coca-Cola's business model? Yeah, yeah, okay, All right. Can we get crystallize this down here? I'm going to try this out for size. Coke business model. Use addictive formula to leverage sugar water distribution through aggressive brand rental agreements and commodity hedges, with the footnote saying the original two ingredients were cocaine and caffeine. So let me read it again. Use addictive formula. Now it's not addictive in the sense of a drug, but people get used to it because of the massive amount of advertising. So use addictive formula to leverage sugar water distribution through aggressive brand rental agreements and commodity hedges. Whew. If I told you this 45 minutes ago, you'd probably said, I don't know what class this is, but nothing I want to stay for. I mean, OK, that, but that's not Coca-Cola. I would submit to you that that's the secret aspects. That's the inside view of Coca-Cola. It's like when you look at a human being on the outside with clothing and you see what they look like. When you open up a body during an autopsy, it looks completely different inside. So this is the autopsy of Coca-Cola, so to speak. This is the inside view. Why is this important given this whole incredibly arcane thing I've gone through? Because you need to measure the right important thing to keep score. So. I've got a little chart up there. If you ran Coke, how would you keep score? OK, we've got the formal bookkeeping and accounting. You can see Coke's 10K. It's unbelievably boring. They talk about you know gross royalty revenue and a bunch of stuff like that. Actually, the words they use are just like I showed you they would be using if they were creators of intangible assets and manufacturers and also if they were in the distribution business hedging sugar futures. But it tells you virtually nothing about the company. So what are the off-the-book measures? And by off-the-books, I don't mean in an illegal sense of off-the-books. I mean, what would be the scorekeeping you'd want to do, as in Moneyball? What would you recommend if you were the advisor trying to push them to the next level? What, in fact, would you be measuring? OK, so I'm going to. Come over here and see where you get some ideas. And maybe it will be helpful to flip back to two prior charts so that you can kind of look at this. This might kind of help you a little bit think about what you would want to measure. Let me just get some ideas up here. What would you, what would you want? What are the important things to measure? Are you, are you 
you saying that they produce or do not produce the concentrate? They produce the concentrate. Secret formula, they produce the concentrate. So volume of concentrate? Okay, so you want, you want some kind of, you want some sort of, uh, you know, concentrate uh, production stuff. Are you cost sensitive about the concentrate? Uh, the concentrate costs you uh, one billionth of a penny per uh, bottle of Coke. The license agreement costs you 48 cents. Are you price sensitive about the concentrate? So you're talking about as the producer of the concentrate? You're, you, have a, you have a relationship with a bottler. The actual physical concentrate you send them I'm just going to tell you, is totally trivial compared to the licensing agreement you have for them to use the brand name of Coca-Cola. And so, frankly, if the concentrate went up 100 times, it wouldn't make any difference. It, 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 I'm just, you didn't know that fact, but, but, uh, but bear with me and let's say, just assume that that is true. So the, um, you'd still want to know how much con concentrate you have and whether it's, wh what do you care about the concentrate, though, as opposed to the cost, necessarily. It's the addictive part, so it's the, it's the taste. What happened when Coke changed their formula? Remember, they went from original Coke to new Coke? So, it's, so you spend time doing what, and what do you care about about, that for, about the concentrate? Marketing. Marketing, but you care about the quality of it, don't you? I mean, what if they had a bad batch of concentrate? It tastes awful. It tastes like, our, you know, it tastes like cod liver oil. That would not be really good, would it? So you really care about the quality. Uh, you care about um, uh, what other kinds of things about the concentrate? Consistency. Consistency, okay. Uh, let your mind go wild now. What, what you're in the concentrate business, you want it to be taste addictive. Think about competitors. What are you, what are you, what are you trying to do here with this concentrate? What is your R&D about? New Coke bottle design? How to tweak the logo to make it look better? What do you care about? How do you make it more ready to the marketplace? I'm sorry, could it be what? How do you make it, your R&D would be, how do you make people more ready to your, 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 your concentrate? Yeah, you, you want to, whatever the addictive part of it is, and I'm not talking about a drug addiction part, but the people that, you know, the, the kind of uh, habit forming aspects, you want to embellish by research. So, and you want to always be moving with any kind of change in taste that people have. And you care about competitors who have a similar taste. You care about the secretness of this, right? So you're going to start to want to measuring certain aspects of that. So what else about Coke do you want to measure? Get away from the concentrate as a physical item. The secret formula itself, what about it? You can, what's to measure there? Except you know the, the combination of the safe. Other than that, what are you, you going to measure? What, what, about, what do you care about in terms of the bottlers? Growth? Yeah, a lot about their geographical position, maybe. How about what, what goes, I'll tell you, if you don't know, the things that go into Coke, other than the secret formula, is essentially water and sugar. And CO2. And CO2. Carbonated water and sugar. That's, that's like 99.999. Yeah, that's, that's what the bottlers are, are adding. It's not your carbonated water and sugar. So what do you care about? Water quality. Water quality, absolutely. And water availability, absolutely. Worldwide. Coca-Cola is the most, one of the most known worldwide brands. They've got bottlers, I think, in virtually every country except for North Korea um, and, a, and a few others. Okay, they're all over the place. They care about water quality. What else? Sugar, you know. Price of sugar is really important. They're hedging that. Pretty hard to hedge water. Is there a water market? Is there a water exchange? Chicago Board of Water Commodities? There is not. Okay, so they can't hedge that. So they're going to do a lot of meticulous measurement of water quality, availability. Absolutely. What else do you care about about bottlers? What if they screw up bottling? Does it matter? <laughs> yeah, so you're going to have like a secret police of bottling? and you want to really ma manage the quality level of the bottlers avidly? Yes, because it's your brand at risk. 
Um, a, a side question, do they not um, distribute it all to North Korea? Yeah, I don't really know. Uh, probably there's smuggled in. I'm sure there's Coca-Cola in North, well, I'm sure Kim, the leaders drink Coca-Cola, you know, you know. But uh, whether, whether the, uh, the people don't, they couldn't afford it probably. I don't know anything about North Korea. Uh, okay, so you get the idea of when you actually have the inside view of what's really going on, you can begin to brainstorm about what it is you're really measuring to figure out uh, where you stand, uh, where competitors stand, and what to actually spend your management energy on. If all you do did was manage to count the number of Coke bottles sold, I would submit to you that you have a depreciated view of what's going on. So let's uh, skip ahead here. And I would say that the, the three C's of scorekeeping are to always be measuring the attributes that matter in your business definition as they relate to customers, competitors, and costs. But do that in addition to financial accounting. Many times the cost elements are never captured in the accounting system, even though supposedly that's what accounting systems are for. But go back to that baseball analogy. Don't rely on the ERA. Start looking at all kinds of different things about baseball or you know, about your, your business that are non-obvious. And that's really the way to be uh, extremely powerful. Um, I've got about five minutes or so, and I'm going to do a very, very quick detour, and then I'm happy to uh, stick around and um, uh, keep going or you know, answer questions and comments and stuff like that. But thank you for bearing with me. This is kind of experimental to try to do something so incredibly conceptual, and hopefully you will find it to actually be of deep practical value. But my accounting detour, I love this quote, there's no business like show business, but there are several businesses like accounting. I thought it was funny. Um, I'm going to just go through about five minutes worth of accounting practical stuff, uh, because you've always got to be paying attention to that side. And there's the three R's of accounting, three C's of scorekeeping, but the, f the three R's of accounting is that it's a recording, a reporting, and a review system of financial transactions. What's important to understand here is the modifier financial transactions. There are many transactions that take place in a company that are important and non-financial. <coughs> and you know what? They don't speak accounting. So there's a kind of a, it, there's a Chinese wall or whatever you want to call it that makes it very difficult to go from the domain of finance and financial transactions outside of that. So you must understand the limitations of accounting because it's really looking at, pardon the pun, one side of the ledger sheet. And you don't want to rely on that. Software. Uh, for most small businesses, uh, make sure it's platform compliant to what you're doing. Uh, you want something that's double entry bookkeeping uh, you want to be able to get your data in and out. Open formats would be preferable. You would need to be able to check, uh, print checks and so forth. Use PayPal. There's a couple of options that are very low or no cost. In the old days for businesses, it was very expensive to have an accounting system. Now it's close to being free. Um, if you're just starting out and you don't have a whole lot of revenue and a whole lot of customers, I strongly recommend QuickBooks Simple Start. It's the free version. Um, it's PC-based, um, so if you have a Mac, you can get Parallels, you know, and run it as a, uh, an application, even on your Mac, uh, but it's really designed for the PC. Um, they've got a QuickBooks Online, um, you know, that's another alternative. Microsoft has got an uh, Express package, which is also free. And these are, of course, they want you on an upgrade path. As you get bigger, you kind of upgrade. But it's cheap, it's easy. And by the way, you can start experimenting with, you know, like QuickBooks Simple Start and set up your whole business and actually start doing transactions and see how you like it. And it costs you nothing. Uh, there's another one that's an open source one called New Cash, but, or good, I don't know how, you know how you pronounce it, but that's another uh, option. Um, you certainly want to uh, rely on the double entry 
uh, method of accounting. For those of you who are business students and have gone through accounting, bear with me. Uh, it's gone, we've had centuries of experience with this. It is the way to make sure that there's an integrity of transaction and, and that's the best that human beings have figured out so far. And it relies on five groups of accounts, assets, we know what that is now, liabilities, equity, revenue, and expense. Bingo, that's it. That is the double entry system and it, those are the, the, the foundation blocks for it. What is an asset? We've covered that. It's a future benefit. Accounting is so simple. It's, it's barely above third grade math or I should, you know, uh, third grade arithmetic. Assets equals liabilities plus equity. These are, these are definitional. That's what this means. This is, this is what we, this is always true. It's not, uh, it's, it's the foundation of it. Profits are revenues minus expenses. It's always amazing to me how many people think revenues are profits. Especially in the popular press, people talk about, well, I have so many revenues. And pe people don't even understand the difference, most people, when you're on the street between revenues and profits. Obviously, uh, we don't make that mistake. Double entry uses debits and credits. The only thing that a debit and credit is, is it tells you, if you were going to do this by hand with the green eye shade on a piece of paper, which side of the ledger you enter the number on. Don't get confused by, you know, uh, th what you know, like a debit card, a credit card. No, no, we're not, it's a different kind of word. It would be better if they just called it right and left, but they don't, they call it debit and credit. Uh, very confusing. Every transaction is entered at least twice. That's the nature of the way this works. Um, and at the heart of the accounting system and the, the definitional table that makes it work and is very important to think through carefully is what's called the chart of accounts. And it's something that you need to customize for your business to make the accounting system as intelligible as possible. Here's an example. I'm using the um, QuickBooks Simple Start Edition, which is free. This is what it would look like on your screen. Uh, this is a chart of accounts. And you'll see on the left-hand side, there's a name of, of an account and then the type of account that it is and it uses those types that we have for double entry accounting. Quicken does one little thing is because they're trying to make this more consumer friendly, they say bank. They call it a bank instead of, of uh, just using a more, uh, uh, another term. But otherwise, that's your chart of accounts and you would customize that. And the way you enter in things, the software, by the way, makes this really easy to do and you don't have to actually get to the journal ledger part. But we've started something called Practicum Inc. And we're going to start it with $100. And this just shows that you're going to be entering in an amount in business checking. Um, and that you're going to be your opening balance. And we have these debits and credits. That's the way the software technically handles it. You get generates a balance sheet, which tells you your uh, assets and your liabilities. Here we have Practicum Inc has got a checking savings for $100, and it's got $100 of assets and $100 of equity, because that was paid in capital, has no liabilities, and our equation is satisfied, the, the accounting equation I mentioned previously. Revenue flow is something you should think through carefully. Um, how, do, how does money come in? Because you need to capture that in the accounting system. Um, the five steps are going to vary a little bit according to what you're doing, but basically you're going to sell something to somebody. Um, there needs to be some kind of uh, history with the transaction. You print an invoice, uh, have a receipt, or something that's going to uh, uh, tell you there was a transaction. The customer pays you, but before they pay you, it's an accounts receivable of some type. Even if they pay you instantaneously, then there wouldn't literally be. You deposit it in the bank, and you make the appropriate accounting entries. That's the way this works. You keep track of customers. This is, again, uh, the uh, QuickBooks software. So you, you uh, set up um, basically essentially a phone book of the, um, uh, of the customers. You have items that you're selling. You set that up. You can generate an invoice because you have pricing. So you can print invoices. You receive payments. It's all in the software. You make deposits to the bank, and that's how you handle revenue. On the expense side, 
you are purchasing an asset or incurring an expense, you have a receipt and an invoice for doing that, you remit, you pay the vendor, you make the accounting entry, and basically that's the way this stuff works. So thank you, and I'm very happy to stick around and talk a little bit more about this topic. That's how you keep score. <laughs>